Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Sometimes parents have to make an excruciating decision. Should they prioritize their child's safety over their happiness? That's the question Lori Frankel confronts in this essay. It's read by Jennifer Beals, who stars in the NBC drama Taken. When our son turned six, my husband and I bought him a puppet theater and a chest of dress-up clothes because he liked to put on plays. We filled the chest with 20 items from Goodwill, mostly grown man attire, ties, button-down shirts, a gray pageboy cap, and a suit vest. But we didn't want his or his castmates' creative output to be curtailed by a lack of costume choices, so we also included high heels, a pink straw hat, a dazzling fairy skirt, and a sparkly green halter dress. He was thrilled with these presents. He put on the sparkly green dress right away. In a sense, he never really took it off. For a while, he wore the dress only when we were at home and only when we were alone. He would change back into shorts and a T-shirt if we were running errands or had people coming over. Then we would come home or our guests would leave and he would change back to the sparkly green dress, asking me to tie the halter behind his neck and the sash around his waist. Eventually, he stopped changing out of it. He wore it to the grocery store and when we had friends over. He wore it to the park and the lake. He wore shorts for camp and trunks for swimming, but otherwise, he was mostly in the dress. My husband and I were never of the opinion that girls should not wear pants or climb trees or get dirty, or that boys should not have long hair or play with dolls or like pink, so the dress did not cause us undue alarm or worry. But school was about to start, and we found ourselves at a crossroads. It seemed reasonable to say, Wear whatever you're comfortable in to school. If that's what you want to wear, you don't have to keep changing in and out of it. But it also seemed reasonable to say, dresses are for play at home only. The dress is fun, but you can't wear it to first grade. The former had the advantage of being fair, what we believed, and what would make our child happiest. The latter had the advantage of being much less fraught. So we asked him, what do you think you'll do with your dress when school starts in a couple of weeks? We said, you need new clothes for the new school year. What should we buy? For weeks, he wasn't sure. And then, on the day before school started, he was. I later learned that this is remarkably common that children who make decisions like this often do so as push comes to shove. They achieve clarity when they are faced with two not-great options. Our child could go to school dressed in shorts and a T-shirt and feel wrong and awkward and not himself. Or he could wear what felt right and possibly face the wrath of his fellow elementary school students. When he woke up on that last day of summer vacation, the first thing he said was that he wanted to wear skirts and dresses to first grade. Okay, I said, stalling for time as my brain flooded with all the concerns I hadn't yet voiced. What do you think other kids will say tomorrow if you wear a dress to school? They'll say, are you a boy or a girl? He replied. 
They'll say, you can't wear that. Boys don't wear dresses. They'll say, ha, 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 you're so stupid. This seemed about right to me. And how will that make you feel? I asked. He shrugged and said he didn't know. But he did know, with certainty, what he wanted to wear to school the next day, even as he also seemed to know what that choice may cost him. I hadn't met his new teacher yet, so I sent her a heads up by email, explaining that this had been going on for some time. It wasn't just a whim. She emailed back right away, unfazed, and she promised to support our child, no matter what. Then we went shopping. The fairy skirt and the sparkly green dress were play clothes. He didn't have skirts or dresses that were appropriate for school. I didn't want to buy a whole new wardrobe when I didn't know if this was going to last. I envisioned a scenario in which he wore a skirt the first day, got made fun of, and never wore a skirt again. I envisioned another in which he got the skirt wearing out of his system and happily donned pants every day thereafter. But mostly, I was pretty sure the skirts were here to stay. School started on a Wednesday, so we bought three outfits to get us through the week. Three school skirts, three school tops, a pair of white sandals. On the drive home, I asked, What will you say back if kids say the things you think they will? I don't know, he admitted. So we brainstormed. We role-played. We practiced, saying, If girls can wear pants or skirts, so can boys. We practiced, saying, You wear what you're comfortable wearing. This is what I'm comfortable wearing. We practiced polite ways of suggesting they mind their own business. Are you sure? I asked him. I asked this while he was behind me in his car seat so he wouldn't see how scared I was. I asked casually while we ran errands so it wouldn't seem like a big deal. I'm sure, he said. He certainly sounded sure. That made one of us. The question I couldn't stop asking myself was, do we love our children best by protecting them at all costs or by supporting them unconditionally? Does love mean saying nothing, not even your happiness, is as important as your safety? Or does love mean saying, be who you are and I will love that person no matter what? I couldn't ask my child those questions, but the next morning I did ask one more time, are you sure? Which was ridiculous, given that he had gotten up before dawn to put on the new skirt and blouse and sandals and was grinning, glowing with joy. We put some barrettes in his very short hair and took the traditional first day of school pictures They're all a little blurry because he was too excited to stand still. But it doesn't matter because that joyful smile is all you see anyway. My husband and I took deep breaths and walked him to school. For my son's part, he fairly floated, seemingly unconcerned. Having decided, he was sure. The things I imagined happening fell into opposite categories, but both transpired. A lot of children didn't notice, didn't care, or stared briefly before moving on, but there were a few who pestered him on the playground and in the hallways, who teased or pressed, who covered their mouths and laughed and pointed and would not be dissuaded by our carefully rehearsed answers. That lasted longer than I had expected, but it was mostly over within the month. At the end of that first week, when he was going to bed on Friday night, he was upset about something. Weepy, cranky, and irritable. He couldn't or wouldn't tell me what the problem was. 
His eyes were wet, his fists bald, his face stormy. I tucked him in and kissed him goodnight. I asked again what the matter was. I asked again what I could do. I told him I couldn't help him if he wouldn't talk to me. Finally, I whispered, You don't have to keep wearing skirts and dresses to school, you know. If kids are being mean, if it feels weird, you can absolutely go back to shorts and T-shirts. He snapped out of it immediately, sitting up, his face clearing, his eyes drying and brightening. No, Mama, he chided. I wish I could say that he did so sweetly, but his tone was more like, Don't be an idiot. I already decided about that, he said. I never think about that anymore. It had been three days. But it was also true. He had already decided. He didn't think about that anymore. And he, she, never looked back. She grew out her hair. She stopped telling people she was a boy in a skirt and started being a girl in a skirt instead. And we, as a family, decided to be open and honest about it, too, celebrating her story instead of hiding it. Two years later, our daughter still sometimes wears the green dress for dress-up and to put on plays, as we imagined her doing in the first place. Now that she can be who she is on the inside and on the outside, on weekdays as well as on weekends, at home and everywhere else, the sparkly green dress has once again become just a costume. That's Jennifer Beals reading Lori Frankel's essay, From He to She, in first grade. More from Lori after the break. Lori Frankel's daughter is in fourth grade now, and she is, very happily, a girl in a skirt. But Lori says it took some time for her daughter to feel clear about her gender identity. There was not a single moment where she did become sure. Over winter break, when she was no longer going to school every day, she asked us to switch to female pronouns. And that was the moment for me. But even then, I thought, well, sure, we're going to try this for a little while, and and maybe she'll go back, and that's okay, too. I think in her mind, it was a slow and indistinct transition, and so she made it in a slow and indistinct way. But once she landed there, all of the ambiguity went away. Lori is grateful that both the kids and teachers in her daughter's life have been supportive and largely unfazed by this change. This kind of a a shift doesn't mean to them what it means to adults in the world. They are kids and they are changing all the time, and, and that makes a lot of sense to them. She is not the only transgender kid in her elementary school. She is not the only transgender kid in her her community. And so to the adults in her life, this is still on our radar because we're so looking out for her and making sure that she's safe and and loved and accepted and protected and embraced and all of these things. And I think that most of the kids, it doesn't even pass through their brains anymore. However, the responses from some of the adults who read Lori's essay were very different. Some were shocking. A lot of people wrote wishing for my death and that of my kid. Um, There were a lot of people who wrote to offer me Jesus, and there were a lot of people who wrote and said, I I bet you were a Jew, and and indeed I am. And so there were a lot of people who who felt that was 
the answer to a problem that they imagined that I had. A lot of people also wrote mostly to tell me that I was misguided and I was ruining this country and I was ruining children and I am the problem with America. And it is, unfortunately, I, you know, probably just part of the human condition that it's the, you know, those death threats, man, they stick with you. <laughs> the, the people who write with nastiness are are hard to get over, but just in sheer volume and also in the level of heart in their responses. The people who wrote with love just had, it's not just that there were more of them, they had more to say, and they had more to say that was grounded in reality. One of the things that is really interesting about watching the debate surrounding these issues, you know, out in the world, out in the rest of the country, is that it has been couched so much in fear and in strangeness and that it's dangerous in the bathrooms and it's dangerous in the locker rooms. And she's just, I mean, the least scary person you might ever ever meet. You know, she's, she's a nine-year-old. Um, she's, like, she's not only not threatening, she's you would never look twice at her. And of course, that is because she isn't weird. Um, she isn't abnormal. She's she's just a kid. She is a kid who, for a period of time, had a, had a strange transition and will again. And that is a wonderful part of, of her identity and who she is. And she's very proud of herself. And we are, of course, very proud of her, too. Lori knows that there are more challenging decisions ahead about hormone therapy, gender reassignment surgery, and much more, and that they won't be easy. It is interesting and, frankly, terrifying to think about going back into the fray with this. I think, oh, no, we we did this. We we figured this out. We've moved on now. And, and of course, everything is going to change again. We will make decisions about what happens next when we get to the time when you have to make the decisions about what happens next. We are not in that place yet. And furthermore, making those decisions before it's time locks you in in many ways to decisions that that I don't want to be wed to. I want to be open to all possibilities. I want her to be open to all possibilities. I want to to have her be able to be whoever she wants to be. Lori Frankel. She's a writer living in Seattle, and her most recent book is This Is How It Always Is. After the break, Dan Jones and more from Jennifer Beals. Daniel Jones, editor of Modern Love for The New York Times. People are so quick to condemn parenting choices, even when they're made with all the information and all the best intentions in the world, those critics are just, you know, lurking, <laughs> saying, you know, you are going to ruin this child's life. But it's, a, it's you know, eventually that will change. The, the more stories like this are, that are made public and the more schools are aware of it and the more parents and classmates and people are made aware of people's private struggles, I think the more acceptance you'll find. And here's Jennifer Beals. I feel the paradigm in our world is changing. And that change is a very, very good thing. And I'm hopeful that this piece will encourage people to be open and honest with others and themselves, and open and honest to others and themselves. Thanks again to Jennifer for reading this week's essay. You can see her now in the NBC show Taken. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Amory Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. We'll see you next week.